Well, uh, over to you. Uh, Jim. Well, I just want to get one little question out of the way. I noticed yesterday you had, like, uh, Freemasons, and you had a little, uh, like, uh, the conclusion to a syllogism for the Air Force. Uh, yeah. Uh, how, how does that figure in with, with, the, uh, with the Freemasons? I mean, I don't know why those three dots. Well, you connected me to the Delta, and on the back of the dollar, you have the... The pyramid. Maybe it's the pyramid. That's it. Maybe it's the pyramid. The three dots, maybe... The pyramid is definitely a Masonic symbol. They take it from the Egyptians prior to Christianity, and quite a lot of Masonic ritual ties in with Egypt, especially with Judaism, of course. Does it have to be in that, or, I mean, in that uh, configuration? What the well, the single dot on top. Single, okay. I, usually, I think, yes. Yeah. The, an interesting question is that, well, tomorrow I think we will look at Pashendi. Uh, how many of you have seen Pashendi before? Obviously, Dave, a few, few of you, yes. You may not mind seeing it again because it's, um, it, it's a, uh, it's, it, it's, it's what the whole scene is about today. Uh, it's what the new church is about. It's the, it's the, it's the best single explanation of the new church. And it explains a lot of other, a lot of other things besides. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you can get hold of Pashendi, then you've got hold of a lot of what's going on today. Pashendi is like the turning point between the old church and the new church, and it explains how that the old church turns into the new church, because the mind unhooks from reality, and then religion comes from inside instead of coming from outside. So uh, it's a it's a completely new ball game. And it's, you can see, we've seen Gregor the, Gregor the 15th, Gregor the 16th, back in 1832, announcing, you know, crying horror, hitting the panic button, really hitting the panic button. And then we've seen uh, Leo the 13th saying that, you know, the, the Masons are getting away with it. And then he's arguing about liberty. I mean, there's a lot of other encyclicals as well, obviously. We've jumped over Pius IX, who came in between Gregory XVI and Leo XIII. But it, with Leo, in Leo's time, you know, I mean, the world was still compar comparatively sane. I mean, it's like a big tree. The, the, the heart has gone rotten, but it takes a time for the rottenness to spread out to the whole of the rest of the tree. So, the Masons have gone rotten, and they're, they're trying to spread the rottenness, <coughs> and the Pope is trying to stop it. Uh, but under Leo XIII, who reigned from, uh, let's take a look at some of these Popes. Um, uh, Gregor XVI, uh, was uh, 1831, I think, to 1846. Pius IX was 1846 to 1878. That's the longest reigning pope in all of history, 32 years. Um, Pius the uh, Leo the Thirteenth who's the one that we've, who wrote a lot of encyclicals, and they're good. 1878 to 1903, he died at the beginning of this century. Then, uh, Pi St. Pius X, uh, 1903 to 1914, he died of a broken heart soon after the outbreak of the First World War. Then Benedict the 15th, Benedict the 15th, from uh, 1914 to 1922, and then Pius the Ninth, Pius the Eleventh, I mean, uh, from uh, 1922 to 1939, Pius the Twelfth. That was on the eve. Uh, the Pius the Twelfth. That was the eve of the Second World War, 1939 to 1958. 
and then came along John the 23rd and the Second Vatican Council. But those are the popes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are the popes of Montes. We saw one in Stephen of Gregory, we've seen two of Leo the 13th, and tomorrow then we'll look at one of Pius the 10th. But all the time, the situation is worsening. Uh, the Pope Leo is doing his best, but it's, it's, a it's, a, it's a logical process, because what happens is that with Protestantism, back under Luther, back in the early 1500s, the devil grabbed hold of half of Europe. Uh, with the French Revolution, he grabbed hold of politics in all of Europe. He, got, he grabbed hold of the politics in what was still Catholic Europe. But the church still resisted. Uh, then, uh, with the, at the end of the century, the devil, sure enough, he attacked the church. I mean, the church still stood strong. With these popes, uh, Gregory the Sixteenth, we saw how strong he was. Pius the Ninth was very strong. He, he might have had slightly liberal ideas when he came to the throne, but when there was a revolution which drove him out of Rome for a year and a half, he had to run for his life in 1848. Then he understood what the modern world was really about. He really understood. And for the next 30 years, 1848, 1878, he governed the church very strongly. Uh, Leo XIII was strong in ideas, but not so strong in action. And therefore, under Leo XIII, the devil who had been pushed back by these tr strong popes, the devil began to work his way into the clergy. Remember, the devil has got half of Europe with Protestantism. He's got politics in Catholic Europe with the French Revolution but the church is still resisting him. So he's now going for the church, and it's logical, and he goes, so going for the church means corrupting the ideas of the churchmen. And Leo XIII realized that the clergy were already being got at. When Pius X becomes pope, he realizes that the clergy is, uh, that, the, uh, that the, pr the problem is inside the church. The Protestantism is at last getting inside the church. And, uh, it was, it was the logical conclusion. And, Pius the, uh, and, and the, the way in which Protestantism got inside the church was with what's called modernism. And the error this time took the form of uh, the Catholic Catholicism must be updated to fit the modern world, only we will keep all of the outside, we will just change the inside and the content and the substance. So we'll keep all the labels on all of the bottles, but overnight when nobody's looking, we'll empty all the bottles out and we'll put something else in so that when somebody comes into the store on the following morning, it will look like it's just the same. But inside, it's completely different. Inside, it's now adapt it's adapted to the modern world. So that's modernism. And uh, th it's Pius X pushed it back so that the, so to speak, the devil had half of Europe, he had politics in the rest of Europe. He's now got the lower clergy, but he didn't succeed in getting the Pope. With Vatican II, he got the Pope. So to go from uh, half of Europe through to the politics of all of Europe, through to most of the church in all of Europe, through at last to the Pope, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a climbing process. And the the uh, way in which the, the devil gets at the churchmen's minds with modernism uh, is that he uh, unhooks their minds from reality, as we'll see tomorrow. Uh, and when men's minds are unhooked from reality, we're getting close to the end. But Pius X, obtained for the church and for the world a 50-year reprieve from 1907 when he issued his encyclical quite soon after he became pope because he realized the incredible danger of this error from 1907 through to 1958 it's about 50 years of reprieve but then in 1958 the pope at last gave up uh, the, 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 such pressure was always building from below Gregory the Sixteenth 
had pressure from a priest from below. Pr Father de Lamne came down to Rome to teach him a lesson. And Gregory the 16th said, get lost. Um, Pius the 10th had a thousand, well, not thousands, but, but a, it, it, they weren't many modernists, but they were very dangerous, the ones that there were, because they could have had a whole lot. So he scotched it just in time, so to speak, when there were still, he had dozens of lamines, dozens of Father de Lamines coming to see him and pressure him from below to give way and follow the modern world. And he told them, get lost. But Pius, the, but John the 23rd had hundreds, if not thousands, of these Felicity de Lamines coming from beneath him, telling him to get with it. And dear, sweet Pope John, thought it would be a good idea to get with it, so he got with it. So what you see is a building pressure against the church all over these 400, 500 years. It's a building pressure. And, uh, and finally the Pope gives way. And when the Pope gives way, that's the end of the line, virtually the end of the line. The church has staggered on since Vatican II, now for another 30 years, but the, since the Pope has given way, which means that the church gives way, because as long as these popes held on, Pius IX, Benedict XV, Pius XI, and Pius XII, as long as they held on, the church held, and as long as the church held, it was like a dam holding back the floodwaters. But the pressure just built up and up and up, and finally the dam cracked. And then all that there was left was, you know, a couple of old moth-eaten bishops to Bishop de Castromay and Archbishop Lefebvre, I, I, you know, a couple of dinosaur bishops, a couple of antiquated bishops. That was all that there was left, so to speak. So now, what happens now? We, we are at the end of the line. And what proves that we're at the end of the line is that men's minds have given way. Uh, the, the mind is attacked. You know, when you attack a man's passions with immodesty and impurity, that's one thing. The passions can weaken the will, and the will may give way to the passions. But so long as the mind keeps on telling the will what's right, the passions are pushing the will to do what's wrong, but the will is capable of resisting as long as it's being told what's right. But if the intellect rots, so that the mind no longer tells the will what's right. In fact, the mind may even tell the will that what the passions want is what is good. Then the will has got no chance of resisting. And then men are just swept away with their passions. So there's, there's no hope from then onwards. So if you corrupt the mind, that's the greatest corruption of all. And this modernism, for the, for the reasons we've been saying today, this liberalism whereby the mind gets unhooked from the object, that gets unhooked from reality, is the ultimate in corruption of the mind. You can't get a mind more corrupt than that. Because the mind is made for reality. That's this. The man's mind is for reality, as his life is for paradise, as his will is for goodness. The will is meant to love goodness. The mind is meant to grasp truth. But if the mind unhooks from truth, then, then you're in real trouble. And so, the, the position that we're in today, whereby the Catholic Church is virtually, of course, the Catholic Church is guaranteed. The Catholic Church can't be destroyed, and that's why, when the popes collapsed, there was one bishop, to, two bishops to keep, keep the truth. But um, uh, they can't take the place of the pope. So what God is doing is allowing his church to be thoroughly and completely cleansed by this terrible sickness, even in the churchmen's and even in the pope's minds. And then when the church is sufficiently cleansed and enough people are praying enough, begging God to give them again a good pope, then he will come back and give them a good pope. But it, we don't know how soon that will be. It may be still a little ways away. How do we get a good pope? Yes, but it would be, if the, if the good pope will be one of these bad cardinals, one of these mushy cardinals, it'll be by a miracle of God's grace. It'll be a miracle. Or it might be, it's, it's possible that God will raise, take a pope from somewhere else. He might find, you know, you don't have to be a cardinal in order to be elected pope. I mean, God could make somebody a cardinal and, you know, I mean, 
God has a thousand ways of... So, uh, it's, it's, you know, he, there are, he's not short of uh, me means of saving the situation, so he could do it by some way that we can't imagine. But as of now, as of, now of course, the, the, practically all of the cardinals are compromised men. They've, they've, none of them kept their... Maybe some of them still have the integ integrity of mind, but if they have got integrity of mind, they've, they've not got enough courage to stand behind their mind, and therefore their mind gets eroded. That integrity, if you don't stand for your integrity of mind, if you don't live as you think, you will finish up by thinking as you live. If your life is not up to your thoughts, you will sooner or later, your thoughts will come down to the level of your life. Because men, men can't live split. Men, men, you know, men, a man is one. And he will integrate one way. He will integrate upwards or he will integrate downwards, but he will integrate. And so, uh, uh, there's humanly, humanly speaking, there is now no hope. There's, there's, the, the church is in a hopeless, a humanly hopeless situation. If we didn't, if we didn't have the faith, if we didn't know by the faith that, that there's no way the Catholic Church can be destroyed, we would be in complete despair. But our hope is not human. Our hope is, rests upon the divine promise. And we, also of course, Our Lady of Fatima, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. And we know that God w is going to come through, but we don't know how and we don't know when. But this, Precisely the, the, what we've been talking about today, what we've been evoking today, this mind, I call it mind rot, which is what it is. This mind rot, which you can see in everybody around you practically, this is the mark of how close we are to the end. You know, it can't go, it cannot go on like it's going on at the moment. It, it's, it's impossible. The mind rot is not limited to the church, I mean, it's in politics too. Oh, yeah, it's everywhere. I mean, it got into everything else before it got into the church. The church, the Catholic Church was the last bastion to resist mind rot. But with Vatican II, they allowed the mind rot in. I say, and that's religious liberty according to the reasoning of that little flyer, which says, you know, that uh, if, you, if you allow religious liberty, then you're saying that all religions are equally good. If you're saying they're all equally good when they contradict one another, then you're saying that contradiction doesn't matter. If contradiction doesn't matter, then truth doesn't matter. If truth doesn't matter, then the mind is a waste of time. That's the logic, and it's entirely logical. So, uh, with religious liberty, the Catholic Church said truth doesn't matter and the mind is a waste of time. So the mush got into the Catholic Church. That's why so few people today can think. You know, they, they don't think and they don't want to think, but they can't think. They've, they've lost the ability to think, except in things purely material. There they can still think, but not in anything of any importance. Any other questions? Yes? The most holy family monastery in the Jewish I'm sorry? The most holy family monastery in the Jewish area? Uh, Where is it? I don't know. I, Father Wickens used to say Mass in the Most Holy Monastery in, um, in New Jersey. I don't know which priest is now saying Mass there. David Perry? Uh, I got a mailer from them last week. Yes. They're pushing a book by Father Wathen. And they yes. have a couple of tapes in there where the brother in charge of the monastery is debating the tags on whether unbapt, uh, unbaptized people can be saved. Yes. Unbaptized so they turn to Yes, so well, that's... Okay, so it then that's the answer. The, they've gone Fenite, yes. The Fenite question is named from Father Feeney, who was uh, in Massachusetts, a Jesuit priest in Massachusetts, who was very strongly anti-liberal, in a good way. But he made the fatal mistake of exaggerating in doctrine. He said that there's no such thing as the baptism of water or the baptism of desire. And that exaggeration enabled Rome to trip him up. And Rome, there was at least an appearance of an excommunication. The, f the followers of Father Feeney say that the excommunication was not real. I don't know. I don't know. But in any case, it had its effect. And the, f the, the so-called Feeneyites were disqualified. 
and they've been disqualified. Uh, they, they have continued to take this exaggerated position in doctrine, which is very, very foolish. I mean, it's definitely church tradition that, that you know, there is such a thing as baptism of, water, or baptism of desire and baptism of blood. They, it may not be very frequent, but what, what Father Feeney was trying to do was to stop the liberals saying that everybody's good guys even if they're not Catholics. In other words, everybody will go to heaven even if they don't get baptized. So Father Feeney was saying, hey, and the, the, the basis for the liberals to say that was, well, of course, the Catholics get baptized with water, but there's other baptisms, so everybody else gets through on baptism of, of desire. Hey, said Father Feeney, no way. But instead of saying baptism of desire is probably most likely very rare and baptism of blood even rarer, instead of saying that these two are rare, he said they didn't exist at all. And that's what <coughs> laid him open to being destroyed, virtually destroyed, so to speak. But otherwise, they have the, the Fenians have got some very good ideas. But when they take that position on baptism of blood and baptism of desire, what they do is to set themselves against the mind of the church. You can't say that, that, that it's the mind of the church that there's only baptism of water. You just can't say that. It's not the mind of the church. I've got, it may never have been defined, which is what they say. If it had been defined, they couldn't argue about it. The, that, 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 that there is baptism of blood and baptism of desire has never been defined, uh, but there are plenty of truths that have never been defined. So it's not because it hasn't been defined that it's not true. And so uh, they, are, they set themselves against the minds of the church, and therefore their Catholicism is, their Catholicism is dubious. It, there's something dubious in it. They're, they're very good on a lot of points. They've done a very good book a mostly very good book on these popes. What do they call it? Our, our Catholic Popes. It's not a long book, but it's very well done from the Catholic point of view. Yes? I mean, I don't know if our Fenians are an example of them uh, all around. We've got a bunch in Cincinnati. Yes. Uh, or Father Roth and Louisville. But yes. Uh, is there any indication of the movement in general that are also rank Americanists? Ah, uh, yes. John McManus of the Birch Society is, I do believe, a follower of Father Feeney, and he's certainly an Americanist in his ideas on America, and like many Birches. And uh, I'm afraid the two things do go together, yes. Whereas um, I don't think anybody will pretend that Americanism and the Society of Pius X go together. <laughs> <laughs> Opus Dei is not good news. Opus Dei is this organization st started by, it's, it's false conservatism, or it's false tradition. It's, 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 conservative in the, it's conservative in the appearances, but it's liberal in reality. And for instance, it, it's known that there were three of them that were, had a great influence in the Franco's government in the 1960s, and they did a lot of bad, they did a lot of harm. Their, exercise, their influence was exercised in the direction of liberalism. So it's that classic formula of modern times, like, like President de Gaulle in France or Harold Macmillan in England, Prime Minister Harold Macmillan in England, conservative on the outside, but sliding with the modern world on the inside. And that's a formula that people like, because they, they get their party on the inside, but they keep up the appearances on the outside. That's a popular formula. But it's false. It's phony. And opposite day is phony. Uh, Jim, I'm actually uh, <coughs> able to have here. Uh, MacArthur was like a uh, conservative on the outside, but his um, the, the uh, Constitution that he wrote for Japan is very liberal. MacArthur. Yeah, uh, MacArthur. Uh, yes. Uh, Saint MacArthur is somewhat different, but um, uh, the. the uh, Arthur. General MacArthur. General oh, yeah, he was a liberal in his ideas. Uh, by the way, I think um, I'm almost certain that uh, uh, Father Feeney died reconciled to the Catholic Church. Yes, he went through, there was a process uh, with the local bishop. He was asked just to recite the Athanasian Creed or something. He wasn't, it wasn't required. The, uh, the bishop, the, 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 the novice order bishop reconciled him without requiring that he recant his quote unquote errors. I think so. I think so. They, ju they just asked him to recite the creed. So... Do the Fenians still have a priest? I think they do have priests, yes. Are they 
I think they do have priests. I'm not sure, but uh, they, you can't trust them for the Catholic mind. You won't get the Catholic mind. On some questions, yes, but it's like the, the, the port side of the Titanic was intact, but the starboard has a gash in it. You know, on this question, the Catholic doctrine is a block, and you have to accept it all. Not only did that kind of fall into that category, did they? Isn't there a monastery somewhere down by Texas down south somewhere? There, there's a, a, a Tridentine group of Benedictines down in New Mexico. Yeah. Yes. Uh, is that a crane in the wilderness? Uh, is that from the... Uh, that, you, that used to be good. Uh, and that came use that came out of uh, New Jersey, Berlin, or Berlin, New Jersey. It used to be very good. I mean, is that the other thing we were talking about before the uh, Mount uh, the Holy Family uh, gets yes. on the same yes. But the, the I think the one who used to write the uh, Holy Monastery, that I think it was John Venari. I don't, and he's not there any longer. He's now editing the Catholic Family News. I think it's called, right? right. right. And he's just got married, poor man. That's and uh, um, uh, so, you know, he's into a new life, uh, if you can call it that. Uh, the, the author now of materials coming out of new Jer uh, Berlin, New Jersey, must be different. I don't know who it is, but... Um, it's style of the Yes, that could easily be, yes. Uh, Pope uh, Pius IX. Yes. Real, real, I read a little article about him, I know it's so cute, I'd like to share it, but one time he was at a, a given audience with a bunch of Anglican priests, uh, or bishops, and uh, and priests, and what have you, and while their departure, they asked him for his blessing, yeah. and he kind of stunned him for a minute, and he finally said it, of course, he gave Latin, and I can't repeat it now, but I don't know, but it was a, May you be blessed by him and his honor you shall be burned. That's right. <laughs> That's it. The priest, when he blesses incense, in, in, uh, may you be blessed in the, in the name of him in whose honor you will be burned. That's at Mass. And it's, it's, Pius IX was Catholic, no doubt about it. He was Catholic. Yes. Uh, he's now venerable. He's been declared venerable. He's up for canonization. If the, if the, it's surprising because he's definitely not a modernist. But the, if the process goes through, he will finally be a saint. See, I think he's called Liberty of the Press of Crime. The? Liberty of the Press of Crime. Liberty of the Press of Crime, yes. O Augustine had some very strong language for it too. A delirium or something like that. Pius the Ninth. Yes. 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 I think that's correct. He, when he came, when Pius the Ninth became Pope, he was a bit soft on liberals. He declared an amnesty and let sort of two or two thousand out of the prisons. He was a bit kind to them, a bit too kind. But then when. A uh, revolution took place right under his nose, and he was chased out of Rome with a crowd shouting outside his palace. Then he understood. And when he got back to Rome a year and a half later, from then on, he no longer fooled around with, with liberalism. But you can't say that he was a liberal, but he was a... You can say, I think, he was soft on liberals. That you might say. Liberalism is a very subtle thing. You know, it's, it's, it's all shades. And he had one or two shades of it when he became Pope, but, but he lost those shades when he had to run for his life. There's nothing like the school of hard knocks. Wasn't Pius XI the same way? Pius XI didn't learn. Um, Pius XI was liberal to some extent, to some extent, especially in action. Again, like Leo XIII. Leo XIII and Pius XI were a bit liberal in action. For instance, Leo XIII wanted to approve of Anglican orders. When the question of Anglican orders came up, Leo XIII wanted to approve, but he did the right thing. He, he set up a, 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 a commission in Rome, and the commission of theologians studied the question of Anglican orders, and they said, Holy Father, there's no way you can approve. So he said, okay, okay, guys, uh, show me where to sign. And, you know, I mean, he admitted, when, when the truth was put in front of him, he admitted it. 
but he wanted to approve Van Kuhn orders, which shows that he was... And then he made a great mistake in, in telling the French Catholics to rally to the Masonic Republic, and that split the Catholics in France with very bad results. So he wasn't as good in action as he was in thinking and writing. His encyclicals are good, but his action wasn't so good. Similarly, I, Pius XI has written some very good encyclicals, notably on communism, on Christ the King, on marriage, on the Christian education of youth. There's a number of very good encyclicals of Pius XI, but in action, he made the great mistake of condemning Action Francaise in 1926, and then he also allowed himself to be deceived about the Cristeros in Mexico, and it's Pius XI who is essentially um, stopped the, Christ, the fight of the Cristeros in 1929 in Mexico, and after that the, the Cristeros were betrayed and, and killed off. Um, Pius IX also, at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War, he didn't come out clearly in favor of Franco or the Catholics. No. And during the 1920s and 1930s, Pius, the Ninth, uh, Pius XI was pussyfooting with the communists. He was trying to negotiate with the communists. He thought he could work with them, he thought he could work with them. exactly. And it took, he, he, he became Pope in 1922, and it was only in 1937 that he wrote his great encyclical against communism. In other words, it took a lot of hard knocks for him to open his eyes. And the, it took the beginning of the Spanish Civil War when the communists and the Bolsheviks were dis killing the priests and murdering the nuns and destroying the churches. Then Pius XI understood. But, but he made a number of mistakes, and they were all mistakes in the liberal direction. See, he, Pius XI was not a Pius X. The best of these modern popes, without any doubt, is Pius X, followed surely by Pius IX. Those are the best two. All of the, all of the others, are, you know, they're good, but they're not that good. <coughs> yes? Who was it? Well, I say, Pussy flitted over to Russia uh, while Pius XII was in range. Was that Montini, uh, uh, Cardinal Montini, Paul VI, the future Paul VI, was talking with the Russians behind Pius XII's okay. back. Yes. With, against, uh, shall we say, without the Russians. To undermine what Pius XII was doing. Pius XII was strongly anti-communist. Uh, all of the, the, the best book on the church in the 20th century is The Whole Truth About Fatima. The three volumes about, uh, are called The Whole Truth About Fatima. They're very good. I think we've got at least two of the volumes here. Volume one seems to be out of print, I'm not sure. But volume two and volume three are very good. And volume two talks about Pius, the reign of Pius XI, and volume three talks about the reign of Pius XII. And the reign of Pius XII, according to this book, and it makes, it makes sense to me, I mean, I'm not an expert. The reign of Pius XII was very good, or good, for the first part of his reign, from 1939 until about 1950. But the last part of his reign, 1950 to 1958, he was winding downhill. Yeah. He was not, he was around 1950, he, was, he allowed himself to be deceived about the question of Fatima. He was skillfully deceived by um, a Belgian Jesuit called Father Danis. And fa what Father Danis said was, the handkerchief Fatima is absolutely true. Oh, all the sweet little girls, the mother telling the sweet little girls to you know, pray their rosary and be good little girls. Oh, that's perfectly true, yes, of course. But the political Fatima, about Russia and all that, no. <coughs> and it, it seems as though, for the last part of his reign, Pius, whereas in, early in his reign, Pius XII had talked a lot about Fatima, the last several years of his reign didn't, never, practically never mentioned it. Because this Jesuit seems to have got to him and persuaded him that Fatima was not all that it was cracked up to be. In other words, that it was just a little affair of girls and had nothing to do with politics, and therefore the consecration of Russia was a complete nonsense and waste of time and so on and so on. And, and therefore the last part of his reign was not so good. I don't know the details, but you can see it, it, uh, the argument presented. It's a very interesting argument, and it's presented in those two books, the, two, the last two volumes of uh, The Whole Truth About Fatima. We've got them here. They're well worth reading. They're quite thick paperbacks, but they're easy to read. Very interesting. And that's the best book about the history of the church in the 20th century, and it's also the best book about the history of the 20th century. How 
um, Stalin made the pact with Hitler in order to let Hitler attack France and England, in order to make sure that Hitler would attack France and England. You may remember that in the, the second secret of Fatima, Our Lady said, under the next Pope, a great war will start. Now the next Pope was Pius XI. Pius XI died in the spring of 1939, and the war was only declared in the autumn of 1939. Therefore, Our Lady got it wrong. Well, the, the Anschluss of uh, Austria by the annexation of Austria by Germany took place in 1938, but what also took place under Pius XI was Stalin's tricking of Hitler into later attacking England and France, so that in effect the attack of England and France began with the, the Ribbentrop, the Hitler-Stalin alliance, which took place under Pius XI. All of those details of history you find in that volume, you don't find them anywhere else. I've never read that, read that kind of thing anywhere else. Didn't the first shot by the Germans take place in Poland? I mean, the first yes, but that's still late 39. That's, that's not sooner than... That, yeah, that's September 1939. Yeah. So, yes? You might be interested if you didn't notice it in the papers. <coughs> Two months ago, the Spanish Parliament voted unanimously. That means all the conservatives to give honorary Spanish citizens to the remnants of the people still alive of the international brigades. Yes. Yes. Unanimous. Yes. The people from the right too. It's yes, it's... Yes, that's an example of the, you know, the, uh, the, the right b no longer believing in what the right stands for. The right believing in the left, making, wanting to make itself popular with the left, I don't know. Maybe they, they undoubtedly think that they're healing the wounds of the Civil War. But uh, the Spanish Civil War of 1936 to 1939, which was a very bloody affair. But um, the, the Pope, Pope Pius XI, did not come out in favor of Franco until 1937. He lay low at the beginning, and it was very important to, this, to Franco that the Pope did back him, as you were saying. Because until the Pope backed him, it was not clear that Franco's cause was the Catholic cause. And already the Catholic churchmen were being tempted, like they are today, to think that all the leftist cause are the Catholic causes. It, it's that terrible confusion. Like Pope Paul VI, who was constantly backing the terrorists everywhere. Paul VI sort of ref I mean, John Paul II refused to set foot in South Africa because they're all so, they're, they're so anti-leftist. And similarly, uh, one of them, you know, they were absolutely against Spain for the same reason, because the, these right-wing regimes, the churchmen no longer believed in the right wing. Whereas, well, you know, they no longer believed in what, the, whereas the right wing believed in the church often. But the, church didn't, the churchmen did not believe in the right wing. The churchmen were constantly going off to make, uh, make friends with the left wing. It's incredible. The left wing said, sure, sure, come on over, come on over. The left wing has got many miles out of these socialistic churchmen. Well, has, has Russia now, or let's say communism now, or whatever, replacing it, got Siberia to Iberia? That was the goal. Siberia to Iberia, yes, that's it. As I look at the map. That's Lenin's plan. Lenin wanted to catch, Lenin saw the key of Europe being in France, I think. And if he caught Spain, he hoped to catch France in pincers. If he had Russia, if he had Russia and Spain, then he would catch France in, in the pincers. Yes, yes, France is the key to Europe. I think that's true to say. And France very nearly went communist just after the Second World War. But uh, But, um, well, I have here this, I have something interesting here, and that is, it, it's a book called The Conduct of St. Pius X in the Struggle Against Modernism. It's in French. It came out recently. It's very interesting. What it is, is, it's, when Pius X was canonized in 1954, you can imagine that the liberals didn't like it. 
and there were plenty of liberals inside the church, and they didn't want him canonized. So they got, very, they got hold of the best, best things that they could to try and stop the canonization, and they threw these in the teeth of the process. And somebody, uh, I think it's a Franciscan father, uh, had to put together the case um, for Pius X on these particular points on which the liberals were then attacking him. So it's an inquest, uh, it's part, uh, the Sacred Congregation of Rites, the, the Roman process of beatification and canonization of the servant of God, Pope Pius X, it's an inquest bearing on certain objections concerning the manner of acting of the servant of God in his victory over modernism. So and there are three main points on which they attacked. Uh, they attacked on uh, the, the Pope's uh, attitude towards journalism. Very interesting. Secondly, they attacked on a controversy in the Diocese of Milan between a couple of root and tootin uh, lead-slinging Catholic journalist brothers, the Scotland brothers, and the soft Cardinal Ferrari. And the Pope would not back the Cardinal by smashing the two brothers as the Cardinal wanted. The Pope didn't say, you're, you brothers, you're wonderful, you're absolutely right, go roaring ahead. But he refused to condemn them. He didn't say everything they did was wise and wonderful, because not everything they did was wise and wonderful. They were two uh, pugilists who were swinging punches left and right, and a few of the punches landed on target and a few didn't. So the Pope didn't say everything they did was wonderful. But what he did do, but he, but he refused to condemn them. And therefore the Cardinal was very upset with him. And so the modernists say, you see, the Pope isn't backing his own cardinals. He can't be a saint. He wasn't backing his own cardinals. So the, 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 they studied the case, and it's very clear that the cardinal was off track. The cardinal was a softy. Oh, I'm innocent. I haven't done anything wrong, Midas. There's no modernism in my diocese. Holy Father, how can you not back me? You leave me out to dry because you won't back me. And the Holy Father writes to him, hey, hey, just a moment. You say there's no modernism in your diocese. Well, there are tendencies. Look at this and look at that and look at that. Oh, Holy Father, you break my heart. Oh. <laughs> Very interesting, the details. The third uh, point is, is even more interesting, and that's the famous case of what's called the Sodalitium Pianum. The Sodalitium Pianum. Uh, let me put that up. Uh, the Sodalitium Pianum. Uh, that means the sodality, or the sort of, the, uh, it's not exactly committee, the sodality. Um, no, it, it's uh, the, the, the comradeship, the comrades of Pius. It's, it's something like that. The, the group of comrades of Pius. Um, and what it was, it was, it was a little organization set up by a, an Italian um, Monsignor called Monsignor Benigni. And that man was something like, something like a genius. Monsignor Umberto Benigni. And the interesting thing is, and this is this, uh, it, uh, acts like a hyphen between some of the things you'll be looking at today and what we'll look at tomorrow. Um, being, uh, up, when you've got the modernists, when you're up against the modernists, the extraordinary thing is about the modernists, just like liberals today, they are evil, they are rodents, but they think that they're saints. They are rats. But from everything they be, from ever, from the, from the way they behave, they 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 are so self-righteous that you'd think they're on a crusade to save everybody and everything with their liberalism. For them, for liberals, liberalism is liable to be a crusade. They've got them. They've got their minds so back to front that they really think 
that what they're doing is going to be the salvation of the church and the salvation of the world and the salvation of it. They're going to bring in the brave new world. They're Catholics in sync with Masonry. And it's a, it's a crusade to change the Catholic Church, to change Catholics' minds, to update Catholics and get them out of their fuddy-duddy old foolishness and to get them in step with the modern world, it's a crusade, and it's such a crusade that the end justify the means. Therefore, these modernists have the right to lie as much as they like, to deceive, and, you know, nobody can say, nobody's got the right to stop them. They have a right to lie. Therefore, they lie without thinking twice about it because it's all for the sake of the sacred cause of updating the church and so saving the church and saving the world. They've got their minds in such a, their minds are in such a mess that they, while they do horrible evil, they're convinced that they're doing great good. So, for instance, when these modernists that Pius X smashed in Pashendi, when they wrote all of their articles, their perverse articles, to how you should empty out the contents but keep the bottle and then deceive all the customers when they come into the shop the following morning, um, <coughs> when they wrote these articles, uh, they would sign them with a different name. And one, one and the same priest would sign with eight or nine different names. And then when somebody in Rome said, did you write that article under that name? The modernist was liable to swear, no, I didn't. Now, how do you deal with adversaries like that? How do you deal with people like that? And as such people inside the church are a measure of the corruption of the modern age. I mean, Ask yourself, how can people doing such evil manage to convince themselves that they're doing good? Answer, because the whole environment, the whole zeitgeist, the whole culture has got to be so corrupt that they can actually persuade themselves. If the culture wasn't so corrupt, they wouldn't be able to persuade themselves. But the culture is so corrupt that they can kid themselves, just like today. Today, a girl can kid herself that if she slaughters the little thing in her womb, she's doing herself and the rest of civilization a great favor. Self-deceit today is very easy. It's very easy, it's very normal, and it's very popular, of course. And therefore, the more there is of it, the more and more there is of it. it it's a self-accelerating process. And, and most people today are getting into it. Well, it was already there with these uh, modernists. So how do you, this man, Benini, said, hey, we need to watch, Pius X says it in the encyclical as well, we, we've got to watch these characters. We've got to have people reporting back to us on the modernists, because since the modernists disguise themselves and pretend to be Catholic and talk like Catholics, and then when you aren't paying attention, they slip in their modernism, then we need somebody listening to these characters, and, and his, in his encyclical he says that, we've got to have people listening to what's going on and reporting back to us. Well, what Benini did was to set up an organization that would do that. And it was basically, he was a very brilliant man. Uh, he was visiting Wales once, and um, three nights of just looking at a grammar book and looking at another book, in three nights, he could read Welsh, which is a difficult language. The man was brilliant. Um, he had the soul, somebody said, of a policeman. Uh, he, he was a brilliant police, he was like a brilliant police inspector. He had that kind of mind, too. Only this time, it's, it's serving the church. It's not serving the state, it's serving the church. And so, Benini, with a few friends and a few contacts, organized such a network of all over the church, all of the point, over the key points of the church. He had such a network of correspondence keeping him informed. They were never very many, but they were good men and they were in the right spots. That, that he published a little bulletin in Rome of everything that the modernists were getting up to. The modernists were furious, of course. The modernists got the Prime Minister of France to scream down the phone at Rome to get rid of that Benini, get rid of that Benini. And then, of course, 
Pius X wouldn't get rid of Benigni because Pius X knew perfectly well what Benigni was worth. Pius X understood that you've got to fight fire with fire. These rodents, you've got to fight with rat poison. So, I mean, I mean modernists, you have to fight with a secret organization or a semi-secret organization, an, orga <coughs> an organization that isn't out in public. Because the moment they were out in public, the modern modernists would immediately lie low again. So in order to catch the modernists at their modernism, you've got, you've got to lie low. You have to fight lying low with lying low. Well, now, the objection to Pius X and the objection to Pius X's canonization was that he was backing this secret organization. It's the, the objection is secret organizations are not Catholic. Now, Pius X was backing a secret organization, therefore Pius X was not a Catholic. And the, the, uh, the, it's interesting, what's interesting is the, how uh, the, the defense of Pius X against that accusation. The defense is partly that Pius X definitely backed Benigni, but he didn't back everything that he did. And he did not encourage him in anything dishonest. And it looks as though Benigni did not do anything directly dishonest. He went to the edge of honesty because, of course, a Catholic cannot, a Catholic cannot make the means, uh, the, the end justify the means. So Benigni was not allowed to justify his means by the end. But he went to the limits of what was uh, a justifiable means. And the Pope, the Pope was very grateful to him and protected him without giving him a full-blooded encouragement. So that was, in the circumstances, the wise thing to do. But the interesting thing is how the corruption was such that only these very, for Catholics, pretty unusual methods were any good, would work. And Benigni, uh, in the, immediately off, uh, from, uh, from Pascendi, in other words, from about 19, the Sodalitum, I forget when it was founded, probably soon after the Pascendi. From then until the end of Pius, the first, Pius X's reign, which is about four or five years, Benigni rendered magnificent service, protecting the, tr uh, protecting the true doctrine and picking out the criminals who were disguising themselves. And you need a kind of police inspector to pick out the hidden criminals because they pres the modernists, according to their doctrine, had the right to hide what they were doing. And they justified themselves and sanctified themselves for that hiding. That's the people that you're up against. And it needed somebody like Benigni in order to uncover them and stop them. But of course, the liberals all scream, this is a police inspector, this is a torturer, this is an inquisitor, this is a spy, this is a... The, the liberals were all screaming because he was putting salt on all of their tails and they still scream. But the interesting thing is that the soft cardinal who seemed so sweet and nice, this is the second controversy, was in fact a rodent. Objectively, he's a rodent. He's a classic example of somebody who's no good at all while seeming to be so nice and so popular with the liberals. On the other hand, Benigni, who seems so nasty, is a real servant of the church. So the softy who seems so nice and charitable is, an enemy of the, is a real enemy of the church. And the nasty son of a gun is the, real en is the real friend of the church. And that's something that people can't today get into their heads. People today are too sentimental to grasp how sons of B-I-T-C-H-E-S can be the real friends of the church, the real servants of the church, whereas the nice guys can in fact be real enemies of the church. Uh, let me read you uh, one or two pages about Benigni. Very interesting. Uh, Question, why does the Catholic Church need any cardinals? Because every king needs some executives. Every chief executive officer needs a number of executives to help him. In other words, it can't go right from the Pope to his bishops or 
his archbishops. No, you, you, you'd, in, you'd inevitably, there would be a few bishops who would act in between you and the rest of the bishops. And those are the cardinals. And they are, a, a cardinal is named from the, from the Latin cardo cardinis, meaning a hinge. The cardinals are the hinges on which the church turns underneath the pope. So the pope needs a first layer of about a hundred helpers, and then he's got about a hundred cardinals, then he's got two thousand or four thousand bishops, and then he's got uh, tens and tens of hundreds of thousands of priests. Why can't they be just priests as helpers instead of the political... Interestingly, interestingly enough, one of the cardinals, the cardinal secretary of state, Antonietti, I think his name was, of Pius IX, wasn't even a priest. He was only a deacon. Antonietti, I think. A very capable man. Antonelli. Antonelli could easily be. Antonelli. Very capable man. And he was only a, de a, a deacon. Uh, or maybe just, even just, a, I think he was a deacon. Maybe he was just a layman. He was, he was a cardinal while he was a layman. A layman. So a cardinal doesn't even have to be a priest. It's an exception, I, and there's been no such exception since. But Antonelli was very capable, a very good politician, and complimented Pius IX, who wasn't such a politician. He, uh, he wasn't stu <coughs> stupid by any means, but he was somewhat saintly, and therefore he wasn't clever in the ways of the world. But this lay cardinal complimented him, and they, and they made a very good team. So a cardinal doesn't have to be a priest. But the Pope does need a... Obviously, he needs a team immediately around him. Any number one needs a team around him. So those are the cardinals. Yes? This is probably a dumb question, but anybody can show up at this meeting. Do we have organizations like that still going today? The Sodalitz in Pianum? No way. Because the Pope promotes liberalism. When you do, you pour on everybody. So <laughs> the, the Pope, if the Pope, if there's any such organization today, it will be uh, picking out the traditionalists, but they don't hide, so you don't need uh, any kind of organization to discover the traditionalists. Because the traditionalists are children of light, and they don't hide in the darkness. It's only the rodents who hide in the darkness, who disguise themselves. Where is I, uh, John Paul I? John Paul I is right down the bottom. John Paul I was... What was his colors? What was his? Colors. Colors? Yeah, his loyalty is... He was... He was conservative. Change, conservative, but modernist. For instance, he, it seems that he was in favor of, of artificial means of birth control. If he tried to approve of it, the Holy Ghost would not have stepped in. And maybe the Holy Ghost... He did. Well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Maybe. But it looks as though some of his ideas were good, but some of his ideas were definitely not good. He had me. He was Cardinal of Venice, I think. Uh, I read the book in... in in God's name, yes. Yes. It, uh, he was surely killed. He was surely killed. So that, that book is way out, is it? I don't think so. I don't think it's all gospel by any means. But the essential, essentially it's saying that he was killed and surely that's true. Do you remember uh, Malachi Martin's uh, response to Bernard Jackson when he was asked... You quoted it the other night. Uh, oh, Go on, yes. Kneecapped is probably putting it mildly. If Mali, I think it's possible that if Malika Martin wrote everything he knew, he'd be <coughs> probably because he probably knows. I read a review of his. I read a review of his latest book in which it said, undoubtedly he knows much more than he says, and I think that's true. <laughs> yes, I think so. Back in the sixties, I think so. I don't know. I don't know exactly. I think he was laicized. He was certainly lived as a layman for a time. But I think he has the faith, and I think he probably always has had the faith. Well, I Mal Maliki Martin. No, he wanted, he wanted to be laicized because he, I think, as I best understand it, he, at the time of Vatican II, the craziness got to him, and he just flipped his lid and, and ran away. Ran away from it all. I think that's what happened. But then with the passing of the years, I think he'd never deep down probably, this is my guess, deep down he probably never lost the faith and with the passing of the years it came back. When he got away from Rome and got away from the craziness and got away from the 
satanic trickery going on, he sort of came back to his faith, and I think his latest book shows that he has got the faith. I think his books show that he has the faith. Well, in, in one of his speeches with uh, Brother Jansen, uh, he was asked about this, and said, I think it was in 63, that, or 64 at the latest, that he went to uh, Paul VI and asked if he, he said, I don't want to be a lay society, and I don't want to be incarnated in the diocese. Right. I want to continue as a priest. And so he claims that he, the Jesuits dispute this, that he got special permission to be a priest of journalism from Paul VI. I, I don't know. I don't know what the truth is. That's what, he, that's what he says. He's an interesting man, there's no doubt about it. Yes? Uh, I, was just, I want your opinion on, on something. Just well, on what? Uh, in some of the Catholic press recently, there's, a, there's a, a cardinal and there's a bishop, they're both retired, they're now coming out talking about the Tridentine Mass, this, the Tridentine Mass, that very support of the, a Bishop Lasso or something like that. Yes. And there's a cardinal, uh, Stickler, Stickler? Stickler, Stickler yes. Uh, what about those two? Uh, Bishop Lazo is a good man. Bishop Lazo is a Philippine. He's reti a retired bishop. He's the of the Diocese of San Fernando in the Philippines, which is, I think, an important diocese. He ceased being bishop, I think, probably about four or five years ago. He retired to a little flat, as I understand, in Manila. And in his flat in Manila, uh, some friends who knew that he's sympathetic to the old religion brought along some books about Archbishop Lefebvre and he began reading them and from one thing, le one thing led to another then he got in contact with our house in Manila in the Philippines and then he began saying the old mass again and the more he the more time went on I, this, this process began maybe two, two, three years ago the more time went on uh, the more he realized that he'd been sold a dummy. Uh, I saw him, uh, I met him again, I met him for the first time actually in the Philippines when he came to our, our house for the very first time, which was, I can't remember, oh, about a year and a half, two years ago. I can't remember exactly. About a year and a half ago, I think. And then, um, that was the very first time when he came to one of our houses, to, to, the, to our house in the Philippines. Then he was in, or a cone in Switzerland a couple of weeks ago for the ordinations in Switzerland. And he was asked to speak after lunch and he stood up and gave a very simple and very, very straight talk about, for about 10 minutes of why he came over to tradition and what, why he thinks tradition is right and he's persuaded that tradition is right. He realizes he's been deceived. He's retired, he's got to be in his late 70s, I I'd guess, mid to late 70s. Um, he'll be going back to the Philippines now. He was going over in Europe in order to visit the society in Europe. <coughs> he'll be going back to the Philippines. The question is now, what does he do when he gets back to the Philippines? And that time will tell. Broadly speaking, there are two, anything, there are two poles and he might do anything in between. Either he goes back to his flat and he lies low, he lies completely low, or he goes back to the Philippines and comes out all guns blazing, or somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in between. But I do believe that if he came out all guns blazing, the Philippines would, uh, because he's a Philippine amongst the Philippines. He's not a foreigner like the rest of us are. That's one thing. And then another thing is that he is, um, uh, he's a bishop, so he's got clout, even if he's retired. He's got those purple buttons, you know, which, which are very persuasive. And if the Philippine people, if he came out all guns blazing, he could swing a lot of Filipinos without any doubt at all. And he has the number of the new religion. And he's sent books on the archbishop to all his fellow bishops, all of his former, former colleagues. So he's for real. The question is whether he has the courage and whether he should have the courage to get assassinated. Because I think if he really does take up a full-blooded ministry, he stands a good chance of getting assassinated. What's his name? Uh, Lazo. L-A-S-Z-O, or L-A-Z-O, I forget. Okay? So he's, he's a good man. He's a simple man. He's a humble man. He's for real. I don't know if he's a hero. He, he may, who knows? Yes. Yep. Yeah. 
There's an article in the June Catholic Bulletin. Yeah, I'm going to be skeptical also, were they men all these years now when they retire? Uh, okay, he he the says that when he was a pre, when Vatican II happened, he just went along with it. I mean, he assumed that Rome knew what it was talking about. All his colleagues went along with it. Of course, that, that, he wasn't a hero then, he wasn't a saint and a hero then, otherwise he would have resisted, but he just went along. He, he, it was the most normal thing in the world to do, literally the most normal thing to do. And it's only when he was finally retired that, and they, his, some friends brought him these books, that he began, he had the time and the opportunity to perhaps to do a bit of thinking and reading, and he's honest enough when he reads these things to say, hey, there's something in this. And then he's got the guts to actually go and visit the house, which a lot of them haven't got. And then he's, he's, got, he's got enough honesty and courage to go on from there, to go back to saying, the, he's gone back to saying the old mass. He doesn't say any other mass than the old mass, no. And it's a, young, it's a young society priest who was here in Winona, who's taught him, Father Tom Blute, who's acting as his teacher to teach him the, teach him the old mass again, or remind him how to say the old mass. And he's celebrating the old mass in our house in Manila. So he's got, he's got something on the ball. Where we go from here, I don't know. Time will tell. You, you cheated, that you were cheated and sold a bill of goods. Yes. To make him very resentful. Uh, yes, he's too balanced to get very resentful, I think. But um, I don't think he's very resentful, but I do think he realizes he's been tricked. That, that's Bishop Lazar. Then you asked about Cardinal Stickler. That's a different case. Cardinal Stickler is really part of the establishment. He is the Cardinal Prefect of the Vatican Library, I think. He's Austrian. He has the old faith, but he hasn't got guts to really come out for the old faith. And you know, to come along to New York and celebrate a Tridentine Mass... Wasn't he the one that... Yes. He was the one that celebrated... Yes, he was the one that celebrated the Tridentine Mass in New York with Cardinal O'Connor. But that's still inside the system. He's not really climbing out of the trap. He's not really turning his guns on Rome. He would like to. His instincts are in the right place, but he hasn't got the courage of his convictions. I remember back in, oh gosh, I visited Don Putti, who was the Italian editor of CC No No, uh, a few months before he died, as it happened. He died a few months late. He was on his sickbed, on his deathbed. Um, and I asked him this question, as Don Putti was a Roman and really knew the whole Roman thing. And I asked him, how is it that all of these churchmen have gone along with the betrayal of the church? It's impossible. And, uh, but it's a fact. How is it, how could they? Aunts, are some of them, uh, surely some of them are good fellows. And Don Putti's answer was, sono tutti delinquenti. Sono tutti delinquenti. He was on his deathbed. Sono They're all delinquents. Sono tutti delinquenti. So I said, but, but, but Cardinal Stickler, Cardinal Pala, uh, Paladin, um, uh, Palazzini, there's a name like that. So, no, two of, the, two of the best of them, let's say. What about those two? And he pulled a face. That's what he did. So, you know, that's the answer about Stickler. He's the best of a bad job, but the best of that bad job is not much in the defense of the church. Uh, is try the video. Uh, um, the, uh, it's easy for us to criticize. I mean, I, I've no doubt that if I had been part of that team, or I'd have gone along with it all, the only reason why I didn't get into modernism and all of that is because I only arrived uh, to, uh, at a seminary well after Vatican II. And the seminary that I was directed to by Providence was an Archbishop Lefebvre seminary. That's why I stayed out of it. So I'm not, you know, I don't necessarily, I, I, you know, I go easy on judging them personally because God tells us not to judge and... Uh, um, I'm sure that in the same circumstances I would have done the same thing or worse. But the fact remains that objectively these cardinals are none of them heroic defenders of the faith. None of them. None of them have done what they really should have done, which is stand by Archbishop Lefebvre. That's the, that's the only answer that works. <coughs> it's the only real answer. 
But a Cardinal Stickler, I would suspect, with, I don't want to be unfair, <coughs> but I would suspect that it's, he's soothing his conscience by coming to New York and saying a mass like that. I'm afraid that's what it is. But it's not really striking a blow for liberty. It's not really a blow for liberty. But it still helps. Yes, yes. Yes, I think it does help. But it's not, it doesn't help as it ought to help. That's, that's the point, because it's still part of the system. Like the they, they're not climbing out of the chicken coop, which is controlled by the fox. They're not getting away from the fox. And they're not teaching other people how to get away from the fox. They're, the chickens are running around and doing a nice dance inside the fox's chicken coop, which encourages other chickens to stay inside the chicken coop controlled by the fox, which is not a very smart thing to do. Not that we are outside the church. We are out, we, the side and Pius X, we're not outside the Catholic Church, but we are outside the Roman chicken coop where the fox is eating up all the chickens. We're out of range of the fox, but that doesn't mean to say we're out of the church. You, you have to distinguish. Sorry, which? There might be a fox who might bite us too, you know, even though we're not in this neighborhood. There might be a fox in... Biting us too. Oh, biting us too. They've had a go, but what can they do? As I say, there are rumors that the Holy Father is going to come to France in September and he's going to offer the traditionalists some kind of deal or agreement or something. But, you know, what can he do? He's, they, they've thrown everything at us. What they can do, what remains for the church to do, is the reunion of the liberal church with the liberal state. And then they get the police to come after us. And that's the next step. That's all that remains for them to do. That's all they've got left. But they've, they've, they've burned up all the weapon, all the church weapons, like excommunication and suspension and the rest of that. And that just bounces off. It, 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 doesn't, it didn't do its job. So they've now got to the next stage is, um, I don't know, bloody persecution. Maybe we aren't into bloody persecution <coughs> because they know that blood builds the church. So as long as we are insignificant enough, the smartest thing for them to do is to leave us alone. Maybe. And that enters into God's plans. Maybe. I, I'm, I, I'm trying to read what, what's going on. And God's plans are that we continue in small numbers to keep the flame burning. And then when the whole thing is sufficiently purified, he sets his pope up again. And then we bring the flame back to the Lord God turns the gas on again. And we bring the flame and it, 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 it lights up once more. You know, the last chapter of the book of the Vatican by Martin Martin is interesting. When the last moment of Pope coming to die, but before he dies, he turns everything around. That's a dream. That's a dream. That's a, that's a Maliki Martin dream. But the interesting thing in the latest, his latest book is that he seems to be recognizing that this Pope is just not doing his job. He really seems to be recognizing that. And that, for Maliki Martin, is a step forward. Until, because very often until now, he's taken the very popular line of saying the church is in a terrible state but the Pope is a sweet and nice man. The Pope is a good man. The Pope is doing his best. That's what Manneke Martin's line I think in his tapes has been. The church is in a terrible mess but the Pope is doing his best. Now how you work that one out? Well in this book he's for the first time I think suggesting that the Pope is not doing his best. And that's, that's an interesting step forward for Manneke Martin. One of the from uh, his previous books. Yes. Yes, I think it is quite a leap. Maliki Martin says, I think he says the traditional mass, yes. So, I mean, he, he's at yes, no, I think that's true, yes. That's, uh, and yes. Um, <clears throat> it would be interesting. Let me read to you this piece about Monsignor Benigni, because. It's an interesting little flash of church history. It's actually several pages, but it, it gives you this idea of, I mean, as far as the, the liberals are concerned, as far as the media are concerned, as far as the church history books are concerned, 
Monsignor Benini is the rodent, but in reality it's the very reverse. Um, was Monsignor Benini the sin of Pius X? Uh, or let me see, there's another one here. Um, Um, I knew intimately and for long years Monsignor Benigni because I was part of the Sodolitz and Pianum, because I was its secretary at the moment it was dissolved. It was dissolved soon after Pius X ceased to be a pope because the next pope wouldn't back it. That's why I consider it is my de duty to speak on this subject, which I can do with competence. Monsignor Umberto Benigni came to Rome under the pontificate of Leo XIII about 1893. The pope had known him in, in Perugia. In Rome, Monsignor Benigni came, uh, came to atten people's attention thanks to his, his d fine intelligence and his brilliant and solid culture in all departments and to a collection of gifts which made him very precious. Because of that, he was rapidly summoned to the Secretariat of State as a sub-secretary in extraordinary ecclesiastical affairs. And in that function, he rendered very useful services to the church. Cardinal Mary Del Val, who was then Secretary of State, begged me to accept to be the Roman correspondent of the universe. I was a little hesitant because I'd never been a journalist. So he sent me to see Monsignor Benigni, uh, exhorting me, encouraging me to take advice from Benigni and to let myself be directed by him. From that moment onwards, <coughs> my contacts with Benigni were progressively more frequent and intimate. I can say that he had the temperament of a policeman and of a fighter, and moreover, that he enjoyed a good fight. These gifts put to the service of the campaign which Pius X had just begun against communism had surprising effects. Never did he use in this struggle illicit or dishonest means, but all human skills and the most skillful of skills were put at the service of the truth. In other words, a very sharp mind. Uh, those who were struck by him, those who he hit, screamed and raised their voice against the police measures and a kind of spying that he was carrying on. But the one must reply that, quote, against extreme evils, one must apply extreme remedies. And modernism was an extreme evil. And that to uncover and to denounce certain cunning forms of error is not strictly spying. As for the Sodolitzim Pianum, one must it must be denied, we must deny what the personal enemies of Monsignor Benigni stated and even printed. That is to say that it was a secret society acting by shady means which was finally condemned by the Holy See. Amongst the documents that I will put forward, uh, we realize that the Sodolitzim Pianum was several times, actually three times, approved and praised, praised and approved by Pius X himself <coughs> in letters of the consistorial congregation. That, as for the Sodolitzim using secret, somewhat clever, and sometimes police methods, I admit that is true. I testify that that is true. But I must give the lie to there ever having been in our system anything illicit or morally blameworthy. I must similarly give the lie in the light of these documents to the fact that the Sodolitian was condemned. It wasn't. It was simply dissolved by a letter of the Holy Congregation of the Council on the 15th of November 1921 uh, and, the, the, and that was because the circumstances of the times had changed. No longer Pius X but instead Benedict the 15th, who was not an anti-liberal like Pius X. As we know, the modernists used to write under other names, and they carried out their vile actions in the most cunning of ways. It was these ways, cunning ways, which forced the church to struggle in a corresponding fashion. And I have reason to believe that an, infini that, uh, an infinite number of, man, of manipulations and tricks would not have been brought to light if we in the Sodalitzim had not used certain ways, certain means in this struggle. On all sides, people screamed out against Benigni. He was accused of hardly being orthodox, of, of having rotten morals, and of being in connivance with Freemasonry. 
All of this is completely false. His ideas, as far as the faith is concerned, were substantially upright. His morals were irreproachable. For years and years, I followed him a little everywhere, and I, was, I, could, I, I met him at any hour of the day and night, even at certain moments when there was uh, just his servant, uh, who I didn't trust. But I never found the least trace of blameworthy morals. He used to, uh, make, he made use of the services of four Polish uh, misses, uh, unmarried women, of, of a certain age, in other words, they were rather older than rather younger, and very pious, who knew many languages and spent all day with him, acting as secretaries for the voluminous correspondence which he had to uh, keep up, either at his own initiative or because of the uh, jobs that he was given by the Secretary of State or other persons. These, these women were sometimes sent here and there to congresses and reunions in order to hold the, in order to know what was going on. So you see this very pious little old Polish lady, who would suspect her? And then she sort of brings out her powder puff and makes a few notes about what the speaker is saying. And then she closes a powder puff and goes back to Rome and gives Munson Benini her powder puff and then he realizes what the modernists are up to. But that's the way you had to deal with them. That's the kind of people they were. And if you sent, if you sent a priest with red buttons to listen to the modernist, it would have been an absolutely impeccable Catholic talk. It's only by sending a little old Polish lady that the modernist will spill his venom and you'll catch him spilling his venom. I have no intention to write a eulogy, to present here a eulogy of Monsignor Benigni, or to, in, to state that he, was, he had no faults, not at all. He had many and serious faults. He certainly committed, uh, he certainly exaggerated because of his ready anger and his impulsive character. He was certainly, he certainly used violent language, and even he used to curse his enemies. <laughs> oh. He little, he, hard, he did not believe in certain forms of holiness, like the holiness of Bellamin or St. Ignatius. <laughs> Interesting point. Uh, so he had, he had even something to say against Sir Robert Bellamin's St. Ignatius Loyola, which is interesting. And he, his opinions on this matter, he uh, backed up with uh, historical documents. He was severely critical of certain acts of the Pope uh, as a political personage and so on. Certain of his manifestations were, came after the pontificate of Pius XI, Pius X, as for instance when he spoke about Bellamin and the Pope as political personages. Benini knew very well Monsignor Giacomo della Chiesa, that's Bene who became Benedict XV. He knew Monsignor Giacomo della Chiesa, the Secretary of State, and he had his own opinion about him. His other, his other faults, that, Monsignor Benini's other faults that I've spoken about are the faults of a man, and I don't see how they can reflect on Pius X. I must also bring to light that there was a violence, a constant and violent struggle between Benini and Monsignor Gaspari, who was the Secretary of State of Pius XI. So Benini and Gaspari clashed head on. A clash which lost until the death of Benini, and which was based on a difference of points of view and methods, but also on other things that I don't know very well. In conclusion, I deny that Benini was in agreement with Freemasonry. He always fought Freemasonry, and he blocked its plans in a thousand ways, uh, which caused it to get very angry and gave rise to violent camp press campaigns against Benini. He, was he had neither honors nor money, contrarily to what usually happened to those who directly or indirectly are servants of Freemasonry. It has been said that Benini was chased out of the Secretariat of State. That's not true. It was the French Prime Minister Aristide Briand, whose wicked plans Benini frequently blocked, who made his complaints 
insistently reach the Secretary of State by, by more or direct means. In other words, the French Prime Minister was putting severe pressure on the Vatican Secretary of State to get rid of Bonini. In the, faced with this difficult situation, which was, uh, lay, which was um, put forward by Cardinal Mary del Val, which Cardinal del Mary del Val presented, Benini spontaneously resigned and he was given a, a, a different job on, by the will of Pope Pius X as a proto-notary apostolic participant. In other words, when the French Prime Minister put severe pressure to get Benini out of the Secretary of State, Pius X simply created another job alongside. <laughs> so that's a real Roman way of dealing with it. You know, you create a, another job with a few more syllables and a few sources. Sort of, <laughs> but Pius X, in other words, Pius X liked Benini and knew the value of Benini. He continued to render useful services to the cause of the faith and to ecclesiastical science and he continued to provide precious information to Cardinal Mary del Val and other cardinals and the ecclesiastical offices, which were very grateful to him for it, as I knew personally. However, he always rested in the background, he remained in the background, abandoned finally by everybody, frequently despised and again calumniated. He was conscious that he had been kicked aside, <coughs> kicked aside but he never complained. See. So that's a real hero of the church, Bonini. That's a real hero, but he doesn't look like it. He looks like a son of a... On the other hand, that's a few pages uh, on this question of Benini. Um, uh, his Monsignor, the, this is the same French priest who was secretary of the Sodolitz in Pianum on another occasion testifying concerning Benini. Benini loved a fight and he hit hard. And that's why people didn't like him. There was, the, there was nothing like the fury of Aristide Briand against him. And the attempts the, by Briand with the nuncio in France to get rid of Benini, and Briand knew what he was doing. The, the enemy knows who are the real Catholics and the, are the real defenders of the faith. And, therefore, and, and the, when a rat like Aristide Briand really attacks, then you know you've got a good man. You can tell a man not only by his friends, but also by his enemies. And it, you say you've got to have the right friends in life, you've also got to have the right enemies. Since Benini was working for the faith, Pius X, who was not without having a certain affinity with this kind of temperament. <laughs> it's a delicate way of saying it made use of him. Given these simple considerations, any impartially minded person, and especially anyone up to date realizing the, the painful situation for the church m created by modernism, is bound to recognize when he considers all things together that there was no other personality so, so well qualified as Monsignor Benini to lead and to maintain on all planes the struggle, the fight for the defense of the faith. Pius X could not have chosen better, given the qualities of Monsignor Benini and despite his faults, which had not all shown up by then. Monsignor Benini had his faults. He was imprudent, he was excessive. Sometimes, rarely, his enemies uh, caught hold of his faults uh, until they managed to obtain his fall. They brought about his fall. It's true, and that's the fact that we're dealing with a human being. They were, above all, the, the faults that go together with his qualities. He lacked delicacy, and he lacked measure. Um, it, that's his problem, and not Pius X's problem. He had as excuse, and above all justification, the fact that he was dealing with people so subtle, as subtle as he was, and above all, with people much more treacherous. The modernists were subtle and the modernists were treacherous. Benini had to be subtle, he wasn't allowed to be treacherous. Sometimes he went further than he meant to, that's for sure. But in the middle of the battle, which he maintained almost on his own, says this Frenchman, the battle for unmasking and fighting the modernists, which Benini carried out almost alone, 
In this body-to-body -body combat with a despicable and powerful enemy, surely he can be excused a few errors in tactics, given above all the number, the strength, and the treacherousness of his enemies. This is the point. And this is somebody who was right in the fight. This secretary was right in this fight. You see, the liberals pretend to us that they are absolute saints. They are not. They are rats. And on their system, the means justify the ends, and therefore they can do, the end justifies the means. They allow themselves to do anything. But if a churchman dares to do anything like that, then they squeal blue murder. They are rats. And they are the people now in control of the church. All that is simply the fact that he was a human being uh, and we don't have the right to accuse uh, those, those who used him of his faults. Monsignor Benini had for him not only these natural qualities, the preparation which made him the right man in the right place, he had other titles which are all to his honor. Firstly, the fact that he was so hated by Freemasonry by the anti-religious politicians, by the modernists, by the liberals, by the democrats. You judge a man by his enemies. The politicians above all, especially Mons Aristide Briand, found him in their way, preventing them from realizing their dark and perfidious plans against the church. They swore to bring him down, and they finally did. However, it is just before history, in the face of history, to say, that he gave, resigned by himself when he realized that his policy was no longer the policy of his superiors. That's Benedict XV. He, he, he resigned in order to go on rendering service. Uh, Monsignor Benini, ha, uh, in favor of Monsignor Benini, is also to be said that uh, had he wished to defend the policy of Cardinal Gasparri, he would have made a career. He had enough talent to be able to uh, think of doing anything. And he would not have died forgotten, exiled, and calumniated as he did. Above all, in the German press, to the point that Cardinal Mary del Val had to intervene to tell, tell the Germans to cool it in attacking Benigni. You judge a man also by his friends, and to name just a few, Cardinal Vives, Delay, Borgiani, Sevan, Sabadell, all of obviously good guys, Boulin, Barbier, Godio, and how many others. These are the most honorable of names and personalities, worthy of esteem by their virtue, their, their brains, and the services they rendered the church. They would never have got anywhere near, let alone made use of Monsignor Benini, if they hadn't had a high regard for him. They would not have helped him if his work had not been for the good of the church. Monsignor Benini, it can also be said in his favor that he lived poor and he died poor. He could have accepted bribes, and if he had, he'd have made a million. What he knew, uh, he used in order to carry on the holy war. Books, uh, title reviews, flyers, the journal of the correspondence of Roman letters. Um, and so on and so on. Abandoned, calumniated, uh, ab ab abandonment, calumny, and poverty, he put up with in a heroic silence because he could have taken his ven revenge. And these things prove his sincerity and fidelity to Pius X. Monsignor Benini also suffered. He was abandoned by all the Roman clergy, and, and his friends and those that he had done favors to were ungrateful to him. They even left him when they had no further reason to fear him, or when they had nothing further to fa favor from him. Um, he, was a, he was attacked in his private life. Um, tu, 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 and he describes his burial. Uh, the other interesting, but I certainly won't start, and I was too late, but. But the Cardinal Ferrari, the, the, the good guy, is the soft Cardinal. Well, there's, a, there's an exchange of letters here in which Pius X says to the Cardinal, look, I don't want you to back this newspaper because it's, it's, it goes to, it's too easy on the enemies of the church and it's too, 
it's too friendly with the enemies of the church. Uh, so, so the cardinal then gave a speech to his seminarians saying, the Pope is entirely with me in supporting this newspaper. How do you work that one out? The documents are there. The Pope then said, <coughs> Your Eminence, I'm horrified, I, I, I'm horrified to hear that you said in your seminary that I'm entirely behind you when you just had a letter from saying that I'm not behind you. Oh, Holy Father, how can you? It was the heartbreak of my life to receive the letter from you where you said that you were so sorry to hear that I'd done the exact opposite of what you said. I never meant to do the exact opposite of what you said. My intentions were as white as driven snow. Oh, your eminence, take it easy. Uh, then, when Pope Pius X dies, Ferrari comes down for the funeral and he tells a journalist, this Pope never supported his cardinals. That's the way these people work. That's the, that, and this is way back uh, you know, 1914, so that the, the church's problems didn't begin just yesterday. We'll look at Pius X on, the, on, on these rodents tomorrow.